All right, I'm going to try to do two things tonight. I'm going to get to the, to the sword of the spirit here in a minute. But I think I want to do something else first, if I can, if you'll just allow me just one second. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm thinking about this passage here in Ephesians 6, where a lot of this for your vacation Bible school has come from. Let me just read a little bit of it. I won't read the whole thing, but just let me read a little bit of it, okay? It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Girded your waist with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And uh, one of the things that kind of jumps out to me is in a lot of ways I'm not familiar with a lot of that. I understand principles that are being taught, and, but I'm not really overly familiar with a lot of it. We talk in vacation Bible school about the battle that is the Lord's. It's kind of a different world to me. I've lived most of my life in Alabama. I just had a little bit of exception when I was in school in Tennessee, but I've lived my life in the southeastern United States. I've, I've lived every bit of my life in what we typically call the Bible Belt. And you can, and you can say a lot about the world we live in now, but I think it's still true to say we live in the Bible Belt. And, and I say all of that to say, I, I think it's important when you look at, at the scriptures that have been a source for this Vacation Bible School, I think it's a good idea to take a step back and really think about just how good the enemy is at what he does. And he's been doing it for a long time. Can you imagine what it was like to make your way towards Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost? Can you imagine what it would have been like for you to make your way toward that place that, that we read about in Acts chapter 2 and, and the events that take place there and and the enormity of the numbers who were present that day, and, and, and the realities that we don't think about a lot of times that, man, there were a lot of people who traveled to that day of Pentecost together, and, and in that grouping of people that traveled, quite likely there were some who were numbered in the 3,000 who were baptized. And there were some in those same groupings that did not make that decision. There were obviously from the numbers, there were some people who made their way toward that day of Pentecost in Jerusalem with a grouping of people that were an integral part of their life. That things changed when a group of them decided they wanted to be baptized. People went different directions. And it wasn't a lot of the world like we live in right now. Uh, back in that particular period of time, it was, a lot of, it was a lot of Jesus 
not Jesus. We live in an environment where we are in Alabama where it's a lot of Jesus on every corner. He's a part of the discussion for a lot of groups. Back then, there was a lot of clarity. And around that time, after the church was established on the day of Pentecost, you, you read about some tough, you read about people going through adversity, you read about persecution. You look at people driven from their homes. You look at people who lost their lives. You look at a grouping of people who were scattered. You're looking at a group of people who their day of worship changed and were, and were trying to, to get in, include their day of worship on what we would call a work day. We're not the Lone Ranger in history. There were people back in the early stage of Acts that were, were having to fit in their life in those early days of their Christianity and, and their faithfulness and their obedience. And, and they, were, they were beaten and pushed and suffered adversity on every side. Those people knew, man, what the battle was all about. They lived it. And as they were living the battle, something amazing was happening. Through all of this adversity and through all of this hardship, the church was growing incredibly. People were becoming Christians on a regular basis. And I guess the lesson is People are attracted to a grouping that are committed towards something that means that much to them. They were given everything they had to the cause of Christ, suffering beatings and hardship, and the numbers were exploding. And here's where credibility to that old enemy comes in. I don't know what point it happened, but it just seems pretty obvious to me it did. He did some rethinking. And some strategies started to change. And I know there are places in the world, even today, where they go through significant persecution. Now, please don't get me wrong, but understand this. Before you get to the end of the New Testament, you begin seeing a change in strategy. And, and the battle gets different. This is, this is a little few things I want to share with you from 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4. And by the way, I remind you that it was man who inserted these numbers. So what you're going to hear from 2 Timothy 3 and 4 is basically a continual thought. And then as I share this, ask yourself, do you relate to the world that's being described in this text? And then ask yourself, how significant is that sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God in this world that me and you are living in? This is, this is 2 Timothy 3, 4, just some different things from these chapters. Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. You must continue in what you learned. From childhood, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable that the man of God may be complete and that the man of God may be equipped. And so in what we would call the last chapter of the Apostle Paul's writing, early on in what we call chapter four, 
to this young man, Timothy, this young preacher that he's about to leave behind. Talk about the sword of the Spirit. He says, preach the word. Hold true to that sword. Why? Why? And listen to this. For the time will come when they, and the, and the pronoun they in this context of Scripture refers honestly to your brethren. That's who it references. It references people who were a part of the body of Christ in the day that they were living in when Paul's writing this letter to Timothy. They, you're my brethren. They will not endure sound doctrine. They, as generations move forward, would not stick with it. They will be drawn to their own desires. I think this paints a pretty clear picture. They will have itching ears. And then it says, they will find teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. That's a long way from driven from their homes. Physical persecution. Your brethren losing their lives. And not to step back and give the enemy too much credit, but from an ability standpoint, I guess you have to say, good job. Because his strategy has been very effective. We live it every day. 1 Peter chapter 5 talks about the fact that the enemy goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But don't kid yourself for one second. The roaring lion has nothing to do with presentation. It has everything to do with purpose. That's what he's trying to accomplish. The devouring of our souls. But, but he does not use roaring lions as the enticement. Good night. I don't want to go to the zoo. I don't, I don't trust that. Do you trust the plexiglass at the zoo? I don't. You know, I got a feeling those big boys can get through that if they want to. I, there's nothing about a roaring lion that I'm overly interested in. The enemy doesn't come at us with roaring lions. I think maybe the best, one of the clearest pictures comes from the early stage of the book of Proverbs when it talks about a naive boy. And it talks about that naive boy and, and the alluring, enticing harlot the beautiful woman that, that appeals to him, that entices him. And the, and the admonition from the wise father in the book of Proverbs is, don't go on her street. Don't go on her doorstep. Don't get close to where she is. The enemy's good at what he does. I think about in Acts chapter 5, when the Bible talks about Ananias and Sapphira. I think about an auditorium. And I think about if I'd have been there the day they walked in, in Acts chapter 5. And I think about what I'd have thought if I'd have seen what they did. Because to my human eye, they walked in and independent of each other and made this wonderful, sacrificial contribution for the good of others. You see, in my eyes, that's what I would have seen. 
Because your, your knowledge of Scripture tells you tonight you completely understand that wasn't the case. Working together in unity, each one making their own independent choices, they had a, con a very clear plan to be deceptive toward, to deceive. They were up to no good. I mean, what was the attraction what was the attraction of the desire to be this integral part of the body of Christ while at the same time to lie toward God, to, to have this selfish spirit and in many ways basically to steal from God? What would be the attraction to want to be so involved in the... Let's make no mistake about it. Everything I read about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 would tell me they'd probably be here tonight, wouldn't they? I don't think there's a reason in this world why we'd think they wouldn't be here. They wanted to be around you. And they wanted to impress you and be a part of you. And the truth is, on some level, they had received this message. And you think about that passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4. You think about the world that we live in right now. They had received the message from the enemy. And the message is, you can have it all. You can have your body of Christ and you can have the world we live in at the exact same time. You make no mistake about it, the battle that we're engaged in is a different battle. It's a spiritual battle. And in many ways, it's a battle with ourselves to find a commitment, and then how about this word, to find a conviction that I'm going to stand for those things that are good and right and righteous in every aspect of, of don't you find it interesting that in 1 Kings chapter 18, the Bible talks about Elijah addressing God's people. And, and what seemed to be the problem? The problem seemed to be God's people. We're wanting to worship God and hold on to Baal the play at the same time. So Elijah says, how long do you falter between two opinions? I love this rendering of the, of the translation. Make up your mind. Just pick. If you're going to serve Baal, serve him. And if you're going to serve God, serve him. But trying to play this both ends, that's not doing anybody any good. But the enemy's got to smile. I, I would challenge you to do this on your own time. You see if you can find any stronger words in the whole Bible spoken by Jesus than what you'd find in Revelation 3 when Jesus talks to people like us. He talks to a local congregation and this is what he said. He said, I'd rather you be cold or hot. I'd rather you be on a worldly extreme than to be lukewarm, than to be somewhere in the middle, than to think you can play both sides of the fence. I'd rather you be cold as can be. And then Jesus gives this strong term. I will spew you out of my mouth. One translation literally says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Let's, let's make it clear. Jesus is saying to people like us who sit on pews like we do, if you can't make up your mind, 
you made me sick. Who does he talk stronger to than that? That's our battle. Good night, preachers and teachers and elders and deacons and Bible class teachers and Christian women and Christian men. That's our battle. A lot of our battle is right here on the inside. That's where the enemy brought it. There's going to be... <laughs> See, here's the thing that always kind of fascinated me. I know you read about uh, Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, and they're in that early days of the church. So they kind of, they're an oddity, really, I think. They're an oddity. Because I'm going to tell you what. I'm not going to come into an assembly and really risk my life for something that doesn't mean that much to me. I'm just telling you. If Clark's life is on the line, if you see me in the auditorium, it's going to be because I'm all in. You can push me, you can test me, you can give me every level of adversity, but if you see me there, you can be sure Clark is all in. I'm not risking my life for something that doesn't mean that much to me. I'm not risking my life for something that I can take or leave. Maybe that's much of the dynamic of why that church grew so much. Because they were in it. They recognized the battle. They appreciated the battle. And they engaged in the battle. Our challenge is to do the same thing within the reality of the world that we live in. We don't just have to make, take stands in the market square. We have to take stands in the pulpit. We don't have to just take stands in the public school. We need to take stands in the auditorium because there are times when the battle is within. The enemy is good at what he does. So when we receive an admonition like that comes to us in our text in Ephesians 6 to take the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God, it is something that, that we don't take lightly. As Joey referenced earlier, it is our one and only offensive weapon in our arsenal. And I also believe a significant point that we need to understand about the sword of the Spirit is that according to the, according to the Greek rendering of that phrase, the term sword of the Spirit has nothing to do with a book. Now, I don't know how many times I've heard this in my life. My, my guess is you have too. You've gone in an auditorium and a preacher or, or, or a teacher will say, hold up your sword. And I don't, I don't really, have, I understand where they're coming from. But you make no mistake about it. In concept, that's as wrong as it can be. Just is. Sword of the Spirit is not a book. The sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God is the sayings of God. You see the difference? This really isn't the sword. It is the sword when you take what's here and it comes here. The leather-bound volume is not your security. Though I guess it makes us feel good. That's, that's fine. I understand that. But the security and the power of the sword of the Spirit is when the Word of God, the sayings of God, have gone from here to here. The sword is when you know what God says.
You remember the first time you sinned? You remember number one? I, I, I tell you the truth, I, I, I cannot in my mind get a grip on when number one was. I know since number one there's been a bunch. Can't really put my finger exactly on when was number one, but I know when number one happened, that changed my world. And it took me from, from being in absolute control of my destiny. When I sinned, number one, I became, let's use this word, dependent. I had to have another to come through for me. When I, I don't want to say I couldn't come through. I, I choose to say I didn't come through. And I became dependent on another. Do you remember when that one came? It was said about that one that he became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived like us. Hebrews chapter 4 is in the past tense. But it describes his life when it says... He was tempted in all ways like we are, yet he didn't sin. And with that, by the way, I breathe a sigh of relief. But I do want to remind us of this. If the Bible is true, and I believe it is, if the Bible is true when it said he was tempted in all manner like we are, it has to mean, not an not a option or a possibility, it has to mean if he was tempted like us, it has to mean he could have sinned, right? If it didn't mean he could have sinned, then he would not have been tempted and he sure wouldn't have understood what I go through. When the Bible says he was tempted, that means he understands and he lived it. Now understand Hebrews chapter 4, it's done. He's paid the price at Calvary. He's at the right hand of God. The church has been established. Victory. The body of Christ is in place. But in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when you read about his life post the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. He could have done it. He was tempted like we are, yet without sin. He became flesh. He wasn't a computer. He wasn't a robot. He wasn't some computerized document that always put the answers in. He knew flesh like us. And so when I open my Bible to Matthew chapter 4, I see a pretty significant event. The Bible talks about the early stage of his ministry. He's been baptized and, and, and the father has said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and kind of gives him his marching order and Jesus goes off and he's beginning his earthly ministry and he starts it off with a 40-day fast. He's out in the wilderness and he's going to be tempted. And by the way, here's something you need to know. In Matthew 4, when the enemy approached the word who became flesh, he knew. I get him, I got them. You make no mistake about it, all those years ago in a time you can't even relate to, your soul was hanging in the balance. And if it goes wrong for Jesus that day, 
it's not just bad for him, it's devastating for every one of us. The moment we commit sin number one and Jesus doesn't get through Matthew 4, we're done. Our fate sealed. Let me, let me tell you this. Are the Braves on tonight? Braves playing tonight, Joe? I'm sure they are. I mean, it's, it's a Tuesday. So I'm sure, you know, I, mean, hey, I don't know why I'd be here tonight. Miles will be home watching the Braves. Not a whole lot of reason for me, me to be here tonight if he can't get through Matthew 4. If he doesn't do his end of it, because <laughs> let's, let's be clear about it. I didn't do mine. I can't remember number one, but I know since number one, there's been a bunch. And the moment number one happened, I became totally dependent on him. My only shot is for him to get through Matthew 4. He doesn't get through Matthew 4. I'm, that's it. And he's flesh. And he's tempted like us. And I'm going to go ahead and say now, I, th I think this is, to not acknowledge this would be a mistake. The enemy wore him out. I, I, I think there, there's not a doubt in my mind. He pushed him to the edge. We'll see why in just a minute. With your soul hanging in the balance, what we would call a vulnerable Jesus finds himself in Matthew chapter 4. Can he get through it? And by the way, I want you to take a, and we'll talk about him a little bit, but Take a real specific look at the temptations that, that the enemy presented to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Every single one of them on some level would appeal. If, if there's no appeal, it's not temptation. If there's no enticement, there's no temptation. As you know, if you've heard me enough, you put ranch dressing on anything, it doesn't appeal to me at all. Not only do I not like ranch dressing, I don't really like living in the same world with people who do like ranch dressing. Okay? Now, I'll be clear. You put mayonnaise on a piece of cardboard and I'd eat it. I like it, but, but ranch dressing doesn't appeal to me at all. I don't like it, don't want to be around it, and really don't want to be around you if you like it. Temptation must have an appeal. Temptation must have an enticement. And the enemy goes at Jesus hard with things that would be enticing, with things that would be alluring. And then I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to remind this great group of people and this great group of people who's living lives yourself, but you're also influencing young people who are scattered throughout this building as well. I just, I just want to, I want to be sure that, that we understand if Jesus waited till he got in the wilderness to figure out how he's going to deal with temptation from the enemy, he'd have been in a lot of trouble. And then let's be clear, if he's in a lot of trouble, so are we. It's obvious preparation for the moment took place long before the moment happened. The heat of the moment is never the right time to try to figure out, what do I need to do here? And so every recorded time, when the enemy comes at him hard, with your soul and mine hanging in the balance, Jesus responded with the words, it is written. Somebody somewhere 
helped him pick up that sword. Somebody somewhere helped him take those words of scripture. Maybe it was a mother's knee. Maybe it was an earthly father in a carpenter shop. Maybe it was the rabbis and the teachers. And I know and I'm sure there was a, a portion of his own initiative. But something got him ready for that moment. Someone helped him with that sword so that he'd be ready to, to fight. Now, here's, there's one thing I want you to notice. I guess that bell meant something, didn't it? What does it mean? What did that bell mean? Did it mean anything? Does that bell mean something? What, what, is it 715 now? Okay, I'm, I'm on, I promise I'll be on. Have you ever heard the old saying, it's easier to get forgiveness than permission? That's kind of where I am. I'm, I'm going to finish up right here. But here, here's something I want you to notice. I think this is pretty significant. Look at this verse in verse 11. The devil left him and angels came and ministered to him. Why did he need to be ministered to? Why did he need this support? Why did he need this encouragement and this uplift? I'll just ask you to consider. How close was he pushed? And if you believe he was pushed, then you ask yourself, how important was that sword of the Spirit? Not just for him, by the way. For us too. Love being with you. Thank y'all so much.